Good morning. Welcome to the Rutgers Council on Public and International Affairs, a student-run, nonpartisan organization sponsored by the School of Public Affairs and Administration, for lecture by Admiral Kenneth Moritsugu, former Surgeon General of the United States. Admiral Moritsugu has had a distinguished career in public service and nonprofit administration. He has served as the nation's top doctor and the operational commander of the Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service. He has been a career officer in the USPHS for nearly four decades, and he is currently Grand Prior of the Grand Priory of America, of the Holy, of the rather, should I say, the Military and Hostelier Order of St. Lazarus of Jerusalem, founded in the 12th century. Let me now bring to the podium Dr. Jeffrey Baxterand, a professor here at the School of Public Affairs and Administration, and the Chairman of the Department of Urban Public Health at the School of Public Health, who will introduce Dr. Admiral Wurtsuko. Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's also a pleasure to introduce um, Admiral Moritsugu, who's going to be talking on speaking science to politics and the role of the Surgeon General. Um, I um, did a little bit of homework and looked on the web, and the first thing I did was look at Wikipedia, which I always tell you students not to do. And then I saw that Bloomberg had a very nice um, biography, and I, a couple things just jumped out at me. He has a BA in classical languages from the University of Hawaii which is not exactly your usual stepping stone to, um, to becoming either an admiral or to becoming a physician or the Surgeon General of, um, of the United States. And we were talking that he was in seminary in, class, in, in um, the ca a Catholic seminar as a younger man before he went to undergraduate. And that that, and I said, well, does that inform kind of who you are and what you've done? And he said, well, absolutely. It's about speaking about the head and the heart and I would imagine moral issues and a range of other things. He also received his MD from George Washington University um, School of Medicine, and he received his Master's of Public Health from UC Berkeley School of Public Health, one of the finest public health schools in the country. He also serves on a number of um, boards of directors, and he's going to talk a little bit, I believe, on one of his real interests, which is in organ donations. So it's my great pleasure to interest, introduce um, Admiral Moritsugu, and I hope to learn all kinds of things. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Good morning to you all. It's wonderful to see you here on a beautiful, bright, sunny day in downtown Newark, New Jersey, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Very good. Um, in my binder, I normally keep a, um, a, a, a uh, poster that uh, I found while I was still in office, uh, and I, sh I share this with you. It says, caution, the Surgeon General has determined that doing just about anything, anytime, anywhere, can be hazardous to your health. Not. Not. <laughs> It, it truly is a, a, a privilege for me to be here today to speak about talking science to politics, the role of the Surgeon General. My comments today are going to focus on two major themes, and I don't know what the problem is, but it's cutting in and out. If I speak this way, can you sure. hear me well enough so I, I won't even do that? Uh, my comments today are going to be focused on two major themes. One is the Office of the Surgeon General and the role of the Surgeon General as the nation's top doctor, and two, a, a specific and timely issue. The position of the Surgeon General of the United States is established in the statutes of the Public Health Service. Over the years, its role and responsibilities have evolved. Before 1968, the Surgeon General had line responsibilities over all public health service agencies, meaning there, that from a wiring diagram, the Surgeon General was really the top person in health in the federal government, as well as being the professional spokesperson on health matters. In about 1976, the position evolved into the Assistant Secretary for Health, a political appointee 
responsible for the direction and administration over these agencies, and the Surgeon General, who became the foremost health spokesperson for the government. The Surgeon General is politically selected and appointed by the President of the United States, subject to the advice and consent of the Senate for a four-year term. But the expectation is that while politically appointed, once confirmed, he or she is the credible spokesperson on health matters and is expected to provide the best available information to the American people to enable them, you, to make decisions regarding your health, your safety, and your well-being, and to base his or her pronouncements on science and evidence, not on politics. The incumbents of this office have stretched back to 1871 as a supervising surgeon of the Marine Hospital Service, and then in 19, I'm sorry, then in 1873 as a supervising Surgeon General, and in 1902, the first instance of the title Surgeon General. Over the years, there have been 19 Surgeons General, most recently, Dr. Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy, a young physician from Harvard. While each incumbent of the office has faced different issues and challenges in recent years, particularly since the iconic Dr. C. Everett Koop, all have manifested a remarkable thread of continuity in their focus, consistent with public health conditions and scientific rigor. I want to take you through three examples of surgeons general and how each of them was challenged to speak science to power, science to politics. Dr. C. Everett Koop turned the federal office with a minimal budget and staff, the office of the U.S. Surgeon General, into the most authoritative platform from which to educate the nation on matters of health promotion, disease prevention, and emerging health threats. He was a pediatric surgeon nominated in March 1981 by then President Reagan. During eight months of controversy and congressional hearings, critics and supporters debated his stance on abortion as well as the question about whether Dr. Koop who had devoted his entire career to treating individual patients was qualified to address the health needs of the nation as a whole. His background was that he was a fundamentalist Presbyterian and some of his detractors were concerned that his religious background would affect his capability in providing the best science. He was confirmed as a U.S. Surgeon General in November 1981, nearly nine months after his initial nomination. Much to the surprise of his conservative supporters and liberals alike, he took strong positions on the dangers of smoking and on AIDS. In fact, in 1986, he published a report on AIDS characterizing this epidemic not as a moral but as a public health issue. In personal conversations that I've had with this giant of public health, he related to me that as Surgeon General, he was the nation's doctor, and he could not have the luxury of applying his own personal beliefs and feelings to these scientific issues. He was responsible to the American people for scientific integrity. In a way only the public health icon could, he personally wrote and distributed to every household a brochure highlighting the science behind HIV and AIDS, the only Surgeon General to ever have done so. In a similar vein, he took the tobacco industry head on 
despite their immense political and economic power, warned tirelessly against the health hazards of smoking for both active as well as passive smokers, and launched a campaign for a smoke-free America by the year 2000. He spoke science to politics. Dr. David Satcher, a family physician and public health specialist, became Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health in February 1998 from his previous five-year tenure as the director for the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention and the director of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Given his long-standing public health background, it's not surprising that he was the most prolific generator of Surgeon General publications, releasing seven reports and three calls to action, raising, ranging from a landmark report on mental health to a controversial call to action to promote sexual health and responsible sexual behavior. The report on mental health for the first time in the history of the office, focused on destigmatizing mental disease and encouraging mental health based on science and evidence. Talking science to stigma. And ever since its release, this document has been the compass for action in mental health. The call to action to promote sexual health and responsible sexual behavior, hailed by the chairman of the American Academy of Family Physicians as an overdue paradigm shift, was nonetheless denounced by conservative political groups as being too permissive towards homosexuality and condom distribution in schools. I recall during the development of these and other documents in which I was intimately involved as the Deputy Surgeon General our conversations, which always included the question, but where is the science and the evidence? And where does that take us? Again, science to politics, science to stigma. Dr. Satcher was also a zealot for the elimination of health disparities. As an epidemiologist, he would recount the number of deaths that could be avoided in communities of color by addressing health disparities in cardiovascular disease, infant mortality, diabetes, breast cancer, and HIV AIDS. Dr. Richard Carmona, the 17th Surgeon General, is a rare breed of physician and human. Growing up in New York, he was exposed to drug abuse and homelessness in his own family. As a high school dropout, he joined the military at an early age, serving twice in Vietnam, being decorated with the Purple Heart for being wounded in Vietnam twice, as a member of the Army Special Forces, returning to attend nursing school and then medical school, working in the Pima County, Arizona Sheriff's Department, heading a major health care system before being selected as the 17th Surgeon General of the United States. He brought to the office a passion for global health, the increasing relevance of health diplomacy globally, and the importance of public health preparedness together with a focus on community health. 35 years after then former Surgeon General Jesse Steinfield in 1971 raised the relationship of secondhand tobacco smoke to health and disease, Dr. Carmona released a report on the health consequences of involuntary exposure to tobacco smoke with the commentary, quote, the debate is over. The science is clear. Second-hand tobacco smoke kills.
His tenure was internally stormy as he testified after his departure that the administration, the politics, had prevented him from speaking out on certain public health issues where the administra administration's political stance was in conflict with scientific and medical opinion. This included attempts to unsuccessfully water down his findings on the dangers of secondhand smoke. Science to politics. Science to power. And maintaining the high ground that science and evidence had to direct the Surgeon General's activities. While I've described only a few of the challenges facing only three of the more recent Surgeons General, I refer you to two excellent books on this subject. I notice you students taking the note now. Plagues in Politics by Assistant Surgeon General Fitzhugh Mullen and the Surgeon's General's Warning, How Politics Crippled the Nation's Doctor, by Mike Stubbe. I hope that in the past few moments, I've given you a flavor of the role of the Surgeon General in speaking science to politics, science to power, and science to stigma and the advantage, the advantage that they had of their possession of the bully pulpit as the nation's top doctor with the responsibility to speak with the American people regarding their health, their safety, their well-being based on science and evidence and not power in politics. Permit me to shift gears now into another timely and relevant topic within the realm of the responsibility of a Surgeon General's communication. Again, based on science and compassion, and that is organ and tissue donation and transplantation. About 10 years ago, the President declared April this month as National Donate Life Month. He did this in order to provide more time to bring the message of life and the message of giving to our society. And every year since, our presidents have repeated the Declaration of April as National Donate Life Month. A couple of years ago, President Obama, in his presidential proclamation, acknowledged those who gave organ, tissue, and marrow so unselfishly. He stated, quote, with quiet compassion and exceptional generosity, organ and tissue donors leave an indelible mark on the lives of countless Americans. Their selfless acts inspire hope at moments of profound need, and they recall the giving spirit that lies at the heart of our national character. For all of us Americans, particularly those of us in the public policy and medical profession. This is a problem with a solution, a problem which over the next few moments, I'm going to encourage each of us to consider doing something about. Today, I'd like us to consider a medical problem from which 123,000 individuals are afflicted right now. And the number and rate of those afflicted, afflicted continues to rise. Consider a medical problem from which 18 people die every day. That's more than one every hour and a half. Consider a medical problem for which there is a solution for which there is no need for these people to die every day, for which there is no personal cost for those who are committed to its elimination, for which reason fellow human beings are dying is because not enough people are willing to do something about it. 
consider a medical problem that doesn't have to be. Now, if we heard this description about a curable disorder or about a public policy problem, wouldn't we want to do something about it? That disorder is the need for organ and tissue transplantation and organ and tissue donation. But what does 123,000 people really mean? Can any of us really picture these individuals? So let me give you a take-home visual. MetLife Stadium, the home field for the New York teams, the Jets and the Giants, has a capacity of just over 82,000 people. So just imagine, as you are attending or watching a home game, that stadium filled with individuals waiting for an organ transplant, and almost half as many more, 41,000 people waiting outside the gates, waiting for an organ to be donated so that they could get their transplant. Even the largest stadium in the NFL, that's AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas, holds 105,000 spectators. Still not enough to contain the number of those waiting. Although last year about 30,000 individuals were fortunate enough to receive an organ transplant, this represents fewer than one in four people who are waiting. While about 80 people receive an organ transplant every day, this list swells by more than 4,000 individuals every month. And that rate of increase rises every month thanks to our newfound science and our capabilities, we're identifying more people who would benefit. On the average, that means that a new patient is added to the waiting list for a solid organ every 10 minutes. We could spend time this morning discussing various aspects of transplantation, surgical techniques, medical management of the recipient, extension of organ preservation while awaiting transplant, and a myriad of other topics. But I don't want to focus on these today. We hear cold statistics all the time. What I'd like to discuss with you today is the other side of the transplant equation, the final common pathway without which transplantation cannot occur and that is organ donation and the people who make it happen. Over the years, despite attempts to create artificial organs or to utilize organs from other species, what is still the rate limiting factor is the availability of organs to transplant. And the only reason that there are so many on the waiting list dying while waiting is that not enough of us have considered becoming organ and tissue donors ourselves. Not enough of us have made the decision to donate. And perhaps just as importantly, not enough of us have communicated to our loved ones and next of kin what our wishes are. There are not enough families who have known what their loved ones wanted on their deaths. And hence, these families were unable to carry out the final wishes of their loved ones. Organ and tissue donation is a personal matter that touches people, and it's a far cry from merely the science and the technology of modern medicine. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where head and heart come together. Because in order to drive home how much what you do every day can make that life or death difference, let me try to personalize what you all do and put a human face to how you can make that difference. I want you to consider two scenarios. The first scenario, you're driving back from a day off taking visiting relative sightseeing when your pager goes off. You call your office. Your assistant informs you that there's been a terrible automobile accident involving your wife. The trauma center has been trying to contact you. You immediately head to the hospital. 
A nurse ombudsman meets you as soon as you walk into the emergency room and identify yourself to the clerk. She escorts you to a small, quiet, private room off to the side. The lighting is soft, the chairs are comfortable, and right now you need both. She informs you that your wife has been severely injured. There has been head trauma. The ER team is working on her, and surgery and neurosurgery are involved. Ominous. She offers you coffee, access to a telephone, and invites you to remain in this quiet room, assuring you that she will keep you informed. She returns periodically to advise you of what is happening. It's not good. The trauma surgeon steps in. The team has stabilized vital functions, but there has been severe head trauma. The neurosurgeon is with your wife. A chaplain arrives and offers comfort. Now the neurosurgeon enters and describes what has happened. Your wife has sustained such severe head trauma that while her heart is still beating, She's lost blood flow to the brain. She's dead. The ER staff is cleansing, cleansing her, and you can see her very shortly. The doctor remains to answer your questions, then leaves you to your grief with your family, who is now gathered. Shortly after, the nurse ombudsman, remember, returns again and escorts you to the trauma room to see your wife who has been cleansed from her injuries. It's a tragic moment. As you are leaving her side, the neurosurgeon joins you, walks down the corridor with you, and gently raises the question about what would you like to do? The memory of an earlier discussion between you and your wife returns. You both had decided to be organ donors on your death and had discussed this with each other. What would you do? Consider a second scenario. You're relaxing at home after dinner. It's late at night. The phone rings. It's a hospital. Your 22-year-old daughter has been struck by a car and is being medevaced by helicopter to a nearby trauma center. She'll arrive in about 20 minutes. You rush, half-dressed, to your car and drive as carefully as you can in your shock to the trauma center, about 15 minutes away. You arrive in the emergency room. Go to the clerk's desk. She brusquely states, I don't have any information about any young woman arriving by helicopter. You insist that this is the case, but still there's no information. Frustrated and frightened, you call your friend the CEO of the hospital, to request assistance. Shortly after, an ER nurse comes out to inform you that a Jane Doe is arriving, but she doesn't know if it's your daughter. You have to insist on someplace quiet to wait. Please, not the busy and noisy ER waiting room. She offers the police squad room, where there are three office desks, office chairs, and a phone. After unaccountable minutes, you sense the beat of helicopter blades and step out to find out if this is your daughter. No one knows. Finally, an ER physician responds and states that a young woman has arrived with little information. The ER team is working on her. You push your way in and determine that the patient is, in fact, your daughter. You retreat to the police squad room to await further information. Your daughter has had severe closed head trauma and is transported to the intensive care unit. You ask for access to a phone to call the rest of your family. The staff point you to the payphone in the middle of the busy hallway next to the elevator. And of course, you don't have any change for the phone. After pacing in the large open, open visiting room while the staff are continuing to work on your daughter, a clerk finally shows you to a quiet room off the ICU where you could wait. 
They provide you continued access to your daughter despite the limited visiting hours. Her brain is swelling in the cranial vault. The neurosurgeons are trying to reduce the swelling with medications. You wait, watching the intracranial pressure values rise. You request pastoral assistance. The staff state, but it's after hours. Can't you wait until the next day? Hell no. After a couple of hours, a chaplain arrives. The next day, the ICU head nurse comes into the small room where you've retreated and states you've got to move out. Another family has a child in the intensive care unit, and they have more need of the room than you do. You're displaced to the large, noisy waiting room. A television is continuously blaring the soap opera du jour. Your ex-wife, your daughter's mother, arrives after an exhausting 16-hour flight from the middle of the Pacific. Less than two hours after she arrives, the neurosurgeon in the middle of the ICU informs her that it's time to declare your daughter dead. When she asks that she can have a little more time, he tells her he's been keeping her alive until she arrived. That evening, a brain flow study is done. The neurosurgeon approaches, obviously prepared to announce the results to you and your family in the middle of the ICU. After you insist on moving to the small room for privacy, he reluctantly agrees. He impatiently informs you that your daughter's brain flow studies confirm her death. Her mother asks, would you please show me at the bedside the clinical signs of her death? He states, it's not necessary. The flow study is confirmatory. She asks, would you please do this as a favor to a mother? He trounces off as if leading a pack of medical students and residents on rounds and proceeds pedantically to perform a bedside evaluation of brain functions. Of brain functions. It's consistent with brain death. He leaves. When the trauma fellow is summoned to provide the second finding of death, he states over the phone, it's not necessary because he accepts the neurosurgeon's findings. When told the family wants to speak with him, he argues, I'm too busy to talk with the family. I have trauma to take care of. Early on, real realizing that your daughter might be an organ donor, you had asked that your regional organ procurement organization be called. They now arrive. What would you do now? These two scenarios, with some editorial license, not a lot, actually happened. They actually happened to the same person in the same family. They both happened to me and to my family. My wife and daughter both died in separate automobile accidents about four years apart. I realize that this doesn't happen to everyone. In the first case, the staff had recognized that I was a physician, and perhaps they provided me a, lit more, a bit more attention than usual. Perhaps there was a bit more than professional courtesy involved. The patient was a spouse of a health professional. But in the second case, also, I had been identified as a member of the board of the hospital, a physician, and the assistant surgeon general. And the CEO of the hospital was, and still is, a personal friend. I don't know how you see this, but in the first instance, we, the family, felt supported and comforted in our grief. And at the point of being asked whether we wanted to donate my wife's organs and tissues, we were ready to do so. In the second instance, we had already had the experience of donating organs once before, and we were favorably inclined. But as our time in the hospital went on and we interacted with staff, we became increasingly negative to the system and to its people and the way we perceived they were treating us. Perhaps it was us who were getting more frustrated and angrier in our grief. But perhaps it was not. And in this instance, I would surmise, were we not already so strongly predisposed, we would have had a choice reply in response to a request for an organ donation. 
with all the effort we pour into raising organ donor awareness, it ultimately comes down to the moment of truth, the moment of decision, the mo moment of making the ask. And we can just about toss everything down the drain if we don't do a good job during this time in better preparing the family for this moment. So then, how does this story play itself out? Twenty years ago, my late wife, Donna Lee, died in a severe automobile accident. We had talked long before about wanting to be organ donors when we died, and I had the privilege of carrying out her wishes. And twenty years ago, because of that decision that she made, and here is the nexus between the medical and the public policy issues, a marine biologist in Tampa, Florida, received a healthy heart. A 35-year-old diabetic hospital custodian in Washington, D.C. received a pancreas and a kidney. A 12-year-old child who was on dialysis and failing in school received her other kidney. A retired school teacher in Pennsylvania received a fresh liver. A young woman in Baltimore, Maryland received one cornea and the other cornea provided new vision to a 49-year-old government worker. Donna Lee was simply an ordinary person who accomplished extraordinary things. Without her generosity, as well as those of so many other donors, this would never have been possible. But you know that this is not the end of the story. About four years later, my younger daughter, Vicki Leanne, who was 22 years old at that time, was struck by an auto while crossing a street in Virginia. She suffered a massive brain injury and died after three days. We believed that she would have wanted to be an organ donor, and so we made those arrangements. But really, we weren't sure. Because how many of us talk with our teenagers, with our young adults, about this? Later, my older daughter, Erica, said to me, Dad, you know we did the right thing? Because after my wife, Donna Lee, had died, my two daughters had had several discussions about their own lives. They noted how so many others had benefited from Donna's final gift and how we, her family, had found such comfort in our loss. And they were only teenagers at that time. And Vicki had stated to her sister, that she too wanted to be an organ donor. And because of Vicki, a mother of five children from upstate New York received a heart and a new lease on life for herself and for her family. A widow with four children received her lung. A 59-year-old man from Washington, D.C., active with a local charity, received her liver. A widower with one daughter received a kidney. A married working father of several children received the other kidney. A 26-year-old man in Florida received one cornea. And a 60-year-old woman in Pennsylvania received the other. Because of my wife and my daughter, and because of so many other organ and tissue donors, many others have gained from a renewed life and an improved quality of life. But when one hears about organ and tissue donation and transplantation, there's a sense that this is an issue that only affects a small number of people, the recipients alone. Nothing can be farther from the truth. Stop and think. Like a pebble that's thrown into a pond, the ripples of life expand outward, affecting not just the donors and the recipients, but families and friends, colleagues and co-workers and others, and these in turn affect so many others in ever-expanding circles of life. Donation and transplantation affect society, not just one person. And for those of you in public administration, you are in an ideal location to help make it happen. Consider what you can do individually and professionally to reduce the number of those dying. We need to focus on three things. One is prevention. We must do more in prevention. It's better to prevent diseases before they happen. But at the same time, 
If they do happen, we need to be ready to intervene. The second is transplantation, because for many, transplantation is the final common pathway that will give them a renewed life and improved quality of life. And the third is donation, because the rate limiting factor is still organ donation. So what's the backstory? The backstory is treat the patient. And the patient is not only the individual under the red blanket or lying in the ER gurney or in the ICU bed with tubes coming out of every orifice. It's also the individual standing around the bed, the family, the loved ones who are themselves traumatized and in grief and in shock. Provide a warm and supportive physical environment. Provide appropriate physical and emotional support. In addition to the curing relationship between healthcare provider and patients, establish a positive and caring relationship between the providers and the family and the loved ones. Communicate regularly and honestly and in a location of privacy and support, a principle that covers many different professions. But you say, we don't have the resources to accomplish this. We're short staffed. We don't have the physical space. We don't have the time. We have more important things to do. And in these times of managed care, we have less and less of time and resources to do more and more. This is an unreasonable addition to an already full plate. If that's your response, then we've lost the battle in this public health crisis. Consider the tremendous amount of resources that we pour into saving a patient. Consider the tremendous cost of re re recovering donated organs. Consider the tremendous cost of transplanting the organs. Consider the tremendous cost of maintaining a su su successful transplant recipient. And in all of this, consider the tremendous benefit to society when one individual donates his or her organs to the several individuals who will benefit directly from receiving the transplant and to the many more individuals who will benefit from having that survivor live and be productive and contributing members of his or her family, community, and society. So let me bring this to a close. We've made great strides in modern medicine, particularly over the past several years in increasing organ and to tissue donation and transplantation. But there is still this gap between the availability of organs and the need. And we still haven't come far enough for the over 123,000 people who are waiting. I applaud you for helping those who can heal to live. Thank you for curing. I encourage you to offer to families whose loved ones have died the opportunity and the choice to make a gift of life for others as part of that health and healing of mind, of body, and of spirit. Thank you for caring. Help others share life through donation and transplantation. And circling back to the principal topic of why we are all here, this is science to power. This is science and compassion. This is head merged with heart. Regardless of what your professional background and vocation is, Always remember that, that head by itself is insufficient, heart by itself is insufficient, but blending head and heart will help dignify the lives of those who we serve. Thank you all for your attention 
And I think we have a few moments now for some questions. Yes. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Sure. Thank you very much for that very, very insightful observation in that question. Um, first, um, let me talk a little bit about the demographics of the need for organ transplantation. Um, the need for organ donation and the need for organ donation and transplantation inordinately affects people of color. If you stop to think about it, cardiovascular disease, which can lead to a failing heart, which can lead to the need for a heart transplant, inordinately burdens people of color. Hypertension as well. Kidney disease and diabetes as well. And so from your question, um, would there be an addressing of the uh, of health disparities by pursuing increased organ donation and organ transplantation? The simple answer is yes, because the need is greater among those who suffer from health disparities. The second question that's embedded in that is, well, but how do we deal with the cost of this? Is Medicare going to pay for it? Is Medicaid going to pay for it? Is insu our insurance companies going to pay for it? Well, organ donation or organ transplantation, a point that I did not really delve into, has become a community standard. It is a community standard where individuals um, who have need for a life-giving, a life-enhancing transplant are expected to have access to that. And I don't believe that there is any third-party insurance carrier that denies that. Under Medicare, there is a special provision for um, kidney uh, dialysis and kidney transplants written into the Medicare law and other aspects of that sort. When you look at it from a hard head aspect, the cost benefit, think about the cost of losing a productive individual to society in terms of earning power, in terms of contribution to society. Um, versus the capability of returning that individual to a full and productive life. Um, that, and, and so when you do a cost-benefit on that, and let me just use the, the example of kidney dialysis versus a kidney transplant, for example, there is definitely a positive cost-benefit by providing an individual who has reached the end of the line from kidney dialysis to provide that individual access to a kidney transplant because individuals who have received transplants 
more often than not, are able to become full and contributing members of society again. I hope that it addresses uh, part, at least, of what you are asking. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, very key. Medical problem that does not have to be. So, at the same time, we live in a society which uh, perpetuates medical problems through wars, infiltrates problems, mm -hmm. you know, creates unnecessary medical problems. So, when you talk about a medical problem that does not have to be, but then we live in a very hostile, war driven society. You made two points. Would you refresh my mind, my memory on the first point that you were making? I know. Oh, I, 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 re I recall that now in terms of a problem that does not have to be. Let me address that first. Um, in my final moments of my comments, I mentioned three things that are important, and the first of which is prevention. And I think under the Affordable Care Act, for the first time in the history of the United States, we are beginning to focus less on interventive medicine, which is fixing something after it's broken, and gradually moving toward a preventive approach. In other words, preventing something from occurring rather than trying to fix it after it's broken. An example of that is obesity and overweight. The American public is a larger and heavier society today than it was 20 years ago. In fact, back in the year 2000, then Dr. David Satcher and I released a call to action to prevent and reduce overweight and obesity in the United States. Unfortunately, one in three individuals today is either overweight or obese. You're young. So this will not necessarily affect you all. But in a large audience, I say, you don't believe me? Take a look to your right. Take a look to your left. And if you don't see someone, at least two people, who are carrying a little bit too much weight, then look down at yourself. That usually brings the audience down in laughter because they're all embarrassed. But it's true. If you look at a general population, look to your left, look to your right, and if you don't see two out of three people who are carrying a little bit too much weight, including myself, by the way, um, it's, it, it's true. By addressing the prevention of overweight and obesity, we can also prevent hypertension, which can in turn prevent cardiovascular disease and on and on and on. So that is one of the areas where I describe a problem that does not have to be. There are two aspects of that. One, by engaging in prevention, the problem does not have to be. Two, by, by uh, increasing organ donation, organ transplantation, the list of people waiting for an organ does not have to be. That's the first aspect. The second aspect I would, I, I would have to challenge you on, and that is uh, the black market, uh, the black market issue. Um, I think, you know, it, w one of the approaches that I take is that everything is ultimately reducible to the bell-shaped curve, everything. And you've got those in the middle, you've got the outliers on each side. And for me to say, well, black marketing of organs never occurs. One thing in medicine, never say always, never say never. 
because perhaps at the margins this does occur. But for the most part, for the most part, there are systems and controls in place to, uh, to, to hopefully minimize that from happening. That's in the United States. Now, if you talk about overseas, that's a different issue altogether because we don't have controls overseas. And that's where you have what is known as medical tourism, individuals who travel to India to have a hip replacement or have a kidney transplant. And where their organs come from is questionable. So um, I, I, I don't want to take the time of the entire audience in, in, in challenging you and debating with you the fact that black marketing does occur. Um, if you'd like, we can take it offline. Um, but in fact, uh, the, the way that the current United States system is set up, it is extremely precise. Individuals have got to, to meet certain criteria to get on that list, to be prioritized on that list, and there is no way that a person can jump that list or can obtain an organ off that list. I'm sorry, I take it back. Never say always, right? There are ways where an individual like you, if you needed a kidney and I was willing to donate my kidney to you, I would say, I am donating my kidney to you. And that's how you then pop up to the top of the list. Okay. But for the most part, if I were donating my kidney to a pool and you were among that pool, the matching is very precise. Thank you. Other comments or questions? And I, and I do invite you to comment as well as you did um, because the one thing I hate about question and answer periods is that the implication is you have all the questions and I have all the answers, and I don't. That's the beauty of science, where we learn from each other. So I'd invite you to also comment as well as question. Well, I'm curious. In your experience, were you ever pressured to change some of the medical health suggestions and um, things happen, and how did you respond if that occurred? Yes. The answer is, <laughs> was I ever pressured to modify, to change a strategy or an outcome? And the answer is yes, I was. Um, and what my approach was, consistent with my predecessors and my successors, was always to base our decision, our action, based on the science and the evidence. If there was a question regarding the science and evidence, I was always willing to re-examine, but not to change a position simply because somebody told me to do so. That would have been an abrogation of my responsibility. Within the government, there are other ways that one can be, quote, controlled. And that is one of the things that Dr. Carmona addressed in his testimony where we, uh, and I was deputy to both Dr. Satcher and Dr. Carmona, as well as the Surgeon General between them, um, where we were attempting to get a report, a document out to the general public. And uh, our political bosses inhibited our capability to, re to publish or to re release those documents. And so in some instances, we uh, were stymied from doing that. And in other instances, we found ways to work around that. So. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. And, um, what I've noticed now, like I've been getting, like I guess a lot of people are getting like burnt out because of the, the 
requirements that are placed upon us, like to see more um, patients with less time and more work. So I'm trying to see what is the future of medicine? Because when you get out, just like I agree with you, prevention is the key, but if you don't have enough time to address all the problems, and most of the problems are social issues, how do you, you know, help the patient? Fabulous. Excellent question. And I think the response to you is inherent in the Affordable Care Act. Whereas in the past, we as healthcare professionals were reimbursed, were paid by the procedure. You were paid every time you saw a patient. You were paid every time you inoculated a patient. That is now changing into a value outcome oriented system, whereby increasingly third party carriers, insurance companies, etc., and the government is frankly moving in that direction as well, where you will be compensated or rewarded, not so much for how many procedures you perform, but rather on how successful you are in curing or in maintaining the health of an individual. Which, frankly, is 2,500 years old. <laughs> yeah. Because back in ancient China, yeah. Yeah. the, quote, physicians were paid as long as the patient was well. Yeah. Right. And as soon as the patient got ill, yeah. the, patient, the, the, the physician was not paid. Right. So, this is this, what you are raising is a very important aspect of our healthcare system, and I, I and I use that word very advisedly, health care system, yeah. as opposed to health system, yeah. because health care system implies you get compensated for every unit of care you provide, as opposed to you get rewarded for health. This is still, you know, this is uh, still in transition, but I, but I would predict that within the next five years, the majority of our health care system is going to be more into our health system. Ambulatory care, for example, when the patients you see in your outpatient clinic, you will no longer be compensated for 10 visits a day, but rather you will be compensated based upon the quality of the outcome, the health status of those who you are responsible for. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Wall. I really appreciate you uh, here. Just in your personal experience, um, kind of well uh, frustrating the importance of uh, uh, the whole definition. And, uh, that's very impressive. And you link your clients to your philosophy of your clients and policies. So based on that, I have uh, just a quick question because uh, I really believe that science is really important. And, but the other part was, even though you have all the evidence of science, but the main decision of public policy is to determine the right policies. We have different issues about interest groups, public interest groups, and uh, private or non-profit or all the companies and politicians. And then once you, that all your evidence is good to that, the other side of uh, politicians, but you cannot control anything over because that determined by the policy side of politicians, how optimistic you are, even though you are as a professional. You, you could do everything as a public administrator or professional, but the main decision is you'll go over beyond your control. How optimistic about that in terms of health issues and Thank you very much. That's, again, a very insightful comment and an observation. Um, what I was speaking about today was the, the, uh, the science and the evidence that underlies a position. What I did not have the time to discuss was the how. This is the what. The how is almost as, in, is even as important as the what. And what I mean by that is how one packages and communicates 
the best science and information to politicians, to bosses, to subordinates, to the American people at large, etc., etc. Uh, and that is an art as well as a skill. That is what you in a school of public administration really are focusing in on. Because we all believe we know the right thing to do. How do we get from here to there? How do we communicate in the best possible way to convince others of the correctness of our science and, uh, and, and our evidence? Uh, and that it, therein lies part of the responsibility of the Surgeon General of the United States to communicate to and with the American people in ways that the American people can understand the best science and evidence. That leads me into another sort of a discussion lecture that will take us far beyond lunchtime, <laughs> which is the concept of health literacy. What is health literacy? Very quick. Health literacy is the capability of communicating in such a fashion that the communication is heard, is understood, is embraced, and ultimately is put into action. And anything short of your communication being put into action would fail. But every step of that is an art, as well as science. So, in public speaking, my presentation to you, organizing it in such a fashion that you can logically follow the way that I'm going, capturing your head as well as your heart by telling a story that's very personal. You will remember the story, and by remembering the story, you will remember the message. And that, to me, is part of the responsibility of you as public administrators, I, as the former Surgeon General, to be able to communicate in such a fashion that people understand. Now, how many of you have seen the Surgeon General's report on smoking? It's a it, it, it's a telephone book, right? Yeah. It, it serves very well to be a dust collector on a shelf, <laughs> a door stop to hold the door open, and totally unreadable by the American public. Really? So what did we do? Dr. Carmoy and I said, we need to publish something in such a fashion that it can be understood by our target. And our target is not the research scientists. Our target is the American people. And so what do we do? In addition to the telephone book, we produce a 12-page, what we call the comic book. Big, 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 um, big font, lots of pictures and graphs, key to a sixth grade education. And let me tell you, those documents flew off the shelves because it's understandable. So I'm, I'm sorry, you, you, got me, you got me very, very agitated. <laughs> <laughs> but you're asking all the questions that are very near and dear. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that um, I actually been working with the Affordable Care Act since 2008 up until currently, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just really disappointed with the level of participation uh, with them, uh, with the community, um, the organizations, as well as the uh, political leaders. Uh, it's such an important. Um, I would say reforming of health care. And I think that President Obama has done a, a wonderful job with the Affordable Care Act and the Patient Protection Act and how it does change up the way that the care has been given in our society. Um, and I, I agree 100% that we need to go back to indigenous ways of treating our health and health care system rather than a more pharmaceutical way of treating our health system, medication and having medication. So I just wanted to expand on that and just say that I hope that you know, the uh, Public Care Act continues to evolve and grow and become more efficient. But 
but most importantly, how do we get more productive people on board on the community level because it's so hard to get people um, where they can be uh, within the healthcare system when you have so many different factors that are blocking the access for people to get uh, adequate information and to gain access to, uh, as you said, a more of a healthcare system. And I find that to be um, a big issue just in the city of York alone. You know, a very big problem. So, um, as someone who's working, you know, to help to um, implement these services and hopefully get the success of the Affordable Care Act, you know, where do we go, what do we do, and, and what, what is the future looking like to really uh, help communities to, to, um, to really be able to navigate this new system? I take your question as a rhetorical one, <laughs> as opposed to one that, that we really have the energy and the time to engage in. However, let me just both finish up by saying that um, this is the reason why you all invited me to dialogue with you, to dialogue with you. Because in this school, School of Policy Public Administration, you have the capability to train the upcoming generation, you have the capability to impact our current generation. And I'm so glad to know that Jack has dual, has one foot in each camp with a appointment to the School of Public Health, as well as the School of um, uh, Public Health, because that is where the bridging rules are. Okay. I, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that we have gone so far over. Thank you so very much for everything and for your, for your interest.